The Lewis and Clark expedition has got to be one of the greatest adventures, explorations of all time. Between 1804 and 1806, Lewis and Clark and a team of about 40 people traveled 8,000 miles over what would be the USA. But there's one man on that journey that didn't get much credit then, and he still doesn't get much credit now, and that man is called York. And it's basically entirely because of the color of skin, because York was Clark's personal slave. That's not right. It's not right. He should get some credit, and I'm gonna do my little part to correct that historical wrong with this video, a biography of York, America's forgotten explorer. So, unfortunately, we don't know that much about York's childhood, but from what we know about the uh, institution of slavery and the little documentation we have, we can kind of piece together what that might have been like. So, he was probably born around 1770. We're not sure exactly when because the uh, records of slaves, births and deaths and things were not really kept. They weren't considered important enough for that. But we can pretty comfortably assume that he was one of Clark's childhood friends. How do we know that? Well, because he grew up to become Clark's body servant, his sort of personal servant, and uh, that was usually picked from one of Clark's childhood friends, because interestingly, in the slavery period of the US in the South, the distinction between white and black, free and slave, was not really enforced until later on in childhood. When these kids were young, they all pretty much played together. We also know a little bit about his family from uh, Clark's father's will, John Clark, in 1799. We know his dad was also called York, uh, his mum was called Rose, he had a sister, Nancy, and he had a brother called Yuba. York may not have matched our stereotype of what a slave is today. As a body servant, he would have dressed very well and uh, he'd have been educated in all the polite manners of the time because he was expected to accompany his master in any social situation and indeed York did probably meet Thomas Jefferson, the president, in preparation for the Lewis and Clark expedition. After the Revolutionary War, York's family moved to what is now Kentucky and, and in this period this was really the frontier between the European colonies and uh, the areas still controlled by Native Americans. And it was a wild place to live. So for example, between 1783 and 1790, over 1,500 uh, European colonial settlers were killed in the area that's now Kentucky. So it really was the frontier and the skills he would have learned, hunting, fishing, uh, exploring that area with Clark, definitely would have served him in good stead for the expedition to come. Unfortunately though, all of the sources, we, all of the information we have about York come from third parties because York almost certainly would not have been able to read and write, or at least in his childhood he definitely would not have been taught that. Slaves were forbidden by law to read or write, if you can believe that. He also would have been uh, pretty well traveled, probably more traveled than we would think. In 1798, he traveled with Clark as far as New Orleans, which was still controlled by, I believe, the Spanish at that point. The Spanish and the French often did a little switchy roo with the New Orleans area. And as I said, he met the president, Thomas Jefferson, in preparation for the expedition. So he would have got about and uh, he would have accompanied Clark pretty much everywhere he went. So he would have been a very well traveled man. So what can we tell about York from the uh, actual expedition? Well, the fact that he was even selected to come on the expedition just proves that he was a reliable man in a tight situation. There was no need for Clark to take York. Indeed, York did not accompany Clark during his uh, years of military service. So it definitely was not 100% necessary for them to take him. And on an expedition such as this, anybody who was not comfortable in the frontier, in the wild, would just have been an absolute liability. So we know that York could handle himself, for sure. We can also glean some uh, interesting facts on him from the diaries that Lewis and Clark kept. So we know on August 20th, uh, one of their sergeants on the trip dies from, we don't know for sure, but it was probably his appendix burst. And uh, York was 
described as the one who uh, cared for him in his dying days. And there are a lot of references to York uh, cheering on the, ex the soldiers on the expedition. So from the sounds of it, he was a very kind, funny man. Now, interestingly, York was a good shot. He is described several times in the diaries as hunting, hunting elk, hunting buffalo. And this is interesting because slaves were forbidden by law to carry weapons in the uh, American states. You could get an exemption for it if you lived on the frontier, like Kentucky, so maybe he had actually been uh, raised to shoot, but they clearly trusted his marksmanship and was described several times in the expedition as being uh, responsible for gathering food. So on top of being kind, funny, he's also a good shot, don't mess with him, and uh, was probably one of the main cooks on the expedition, or at least responsible for a lot of the gathering of food. Perhaps because he was such a good shot and so good at uh, gathering food. The only physical, good physical description we have of him describes him as pretty chubby at the start of the expedition. This is from uh, Clark's diary and it goes, we retired at sunset, my servant nearly exhausted with heat, thirst and fatigue. He being fat and unaccustomed to walk as fast as I. <laughs> Maybe before the trip started he did enjoy his food a little bit too much and had uh, piled on a few pounds. He definitely would go on to lose weight though during this expedition. There are numerous times when they were extremely hungry, running very low on food, so I'm sure by the time he came back he was uh, slim and trim. But at the start, a bit chubby and slow. Many of the tribes that the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition came across had never seen black people before. They may have seen a, a few white people with uh, fur traders and fur trappers coming down from Canada and places like that. York's blackness was a big novelty for the Native Americans and it, at key moments in the trip may have even saved the expedition. We also know that his black skin were, made him a bit popular with the Native American ladies and there's even a description of a Native American man offering York his wife and standing outside of the hut, the teepee, where they were staying in until York and his wife had finished and, and this man kept guard to make sure they weren't disturbed. That's definitely an interesting uh, cultural thing from Native American tribes and without any saying of whether it's good or bad, it's just interesting how a society can evolve manners like that that are so different from ours now. I find that really interesting. Unfortunately, later scholars in the 19th and early 20th century used the, the few examples of York sleeping with Native American women to, to tie into their black virility cliche that black men were a danger to white women and things like that. So unfortunately that that information was really counted against York, even though he's not described as taking more sexual favors than uh, any of the other men on the trip. They really, later scholars really marked that against him and used it to uh, enforce their racial stereotypes. So. There's one specific example of York's blackness potentially saving the whole expedition. So at one point, Lewis and Clark had split up to try and find the uh, Shoshone tribe of Native Americans because they knew that they had a lot of horses and they would definitely need horses to continue the expedition. Clark was going down what's now the Jefferson River. Lewis was on land. Lewis finds the Shoshones first and they greet him well, everything's going fine, but after a couple of days they start to get suspicious of the intentions of the white people. Probably correctly, even though Lewis and Clark had no ambitions to colonize that land as such, we know what happened afterwards. Shoshones, you were right to be suspicious. They thought this was going to be an ambush and they were really on the verge of leaving without giving the expedition any horses. And Lewis is trying to tempt them to stay. He swapped clothes with them, he gave them all sorts of gifts that he could, but they were still not really interested. It was only the promise of seeing a black person that would be on the boat with Clark that really sort of tempted them to stay. And 
you know, they had never seen a black person before. They wanted to know if that was even possible. So they stayed and uh, waited for Clark to arrive. Of course, York was on there and they were not disappointed. Not only that, but the uh, Native American translator on the trip, Sacagawea, she turned out to be the long-lost sister of the chief of the tribe. So what are the odds of that? Just those two small quirks of fate. One, that the expedition happened to involve an African-American. Two, that the translator happened to be the chief's long-lost sister really saved the expedition. But for that, who knows what would have happened to it. Another interesting thing that happened to York on this trip was that he may have been the first African-American to vote in the USA or in a, in a group sponsored by the USA. So when they made it to the Pacific after a year of traveling, they were camped on the uh, north side of the river where I am now. But they had run out of food, there was no game to hunt, they were starving to death. And they wanted to take a vote on whether to go to the south side of the river over there. Interestingly, York and Sacagawea were allowed to vote as well. An African-American slave and a Native American woman, and their vote was treated as equal to that of their white male European counterparts. Maybe they thought nothing of it. Maybe in the group dynamic, their opinions were regularly taken into account. We don't know, but it certainly is not the norm for American society in that time to uh, value the opinion of African-Americans. And it may well be the first time an African-American voted on an equal footing to his white counterparts. So, interesting stuff. So what of York's life after the expedition? Well, after the expedition, everyone that participated got land and even double pay, except for York, who was not even freed after that expedition. Indeed, he was a slave for at least five more years. We don't know exactly how long, but he basically got no reward for his efforts. Not only did he get no reward, but his life even took a turn for the worst. By 1809, he was no longer Clark's body servant, his personal attendant. We don't know exactly what the situation was that caused that falling out, but that's a big loss of status for York. He was even hired out to other plantations, and slaves that were hired out to other plantations were the lowest level of American society. Their new masters were only responsible for them for one year. They had no long-term interest in their health or well-being. They're often overworked and subject to the most extreme punishments. We do know from that time period that York, in the plantation that he was hired out to, gained a wife. But again, tragically, his wife their master moved to New York, took the wife with him, York's family is separated. And that's just the, the cold hard reality that a lot of African Americans had to deal with in that time. Their families could be split up at a moment's notice with no, uh, no ability to control that, fight that, no ability to do anything to stop it really. Tragedy, it must have been heartbreaking for the guy. York did eventually gain his freedom in 1832, Washington Irving, an American author, visited Clark and uh, in their conversation he happened to ask about York, according to Clark. And again, we just have to take Clark's word for it because there's no written sources that York left himself. But according to Clark, he left York with six horses and a business to run in Tennessee. According to Clark, York failed in his business hated his freedom and was attempting to return to Clark to volunteer to be a slave again when he was killed by cholera. We have to take this uh, information with a pinch of salt and we really have to, to try and look at it from a different perspective because first of all, well, this is only Clark's perspective. We don't know what York truly felt because we don't have any of his writing. Second of all, Clark describes York as failing in his business due to his laziness. Now. Just a few years before, York had traveled 8,000 miles through hostile territory and back again. This is not the actions of a lazy man. And indeed, there are a lot of things that would prevent African Americans from being successful in their businesses. So, for example, for freed black people, 
It was often a very lonely life if they continued to live in the South because laws forbade them from contacting uh, African Americans who were still slaves. The slave masters were afraid that seeing free black people around would encourage a revolt and uh, they wanted nothing to do with free black people. So on top of the fact that he was not allowed to associate with slaves who were the vast majority of uh, African Americans in the South at that time. He was also widely hated by the white population. They really resented free black businesses. They didn't want to have anything to do with them and at any possible opportunity those businesses were replaced by white owned businesses. Even if York's business did fail. Considering he was legally barred from associating with slaves and uh, the majority of the white population hated the fact that they were free is who's going to be his customers you know you've got to take this source oh his business failed because he was lazy you've got to take that with a huge pinch of salt there were huge obstacles in the way of being a successful free black person in that time huge obstacles Now, there is one mystery surrounding York's life, one big mystery, and that is, did he really die of cholera? When uh, Washington Irving visited Clark, this was in St. Louis, Missouri. York's business was in Tennessee. So that whole, his business failed because he was lazy and he died of cholera. Clark is just hearing this third person. He wasn't actually there. Why is that important that he wasn't there? Well, because there's another source from 1832 that contradicts this story. There was a young man named Zenas Leonard who was traveling over the Rockies as a furs trapper and he was trading with a tribe of Crow Native Americans for horses and in that tribe he met a black man who said that he first came to this area with the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now there's only one man who really fits that bill. He also describes him as old and by the 1830s York would have been in his 50s or 60s so again that fits the description. We already know that York got on well with the Native American societies so it's not strange that he would be able to live with them. Perhaps his business in Tennessee did fail and rather than come back to Clark he headed west. He certainly had the ability, he'd already done it. He knew the terrain, he knew how to interact with Native Americans. It's entirely possible that he did head west instead of heading back to uh, Missouri to be with Clark. We don't know for sure, there are a couple of other contenders of who it could be, a couple of mixed race people who are the children of fur trappers and African Americans and Native Americans who could also fit the bill as, as a black man. But realistically, we'll never know for sure. And I personally hope it is York because uh, Zenas Leonard, he wrote that this black man, he enjoys perfect peace and satisfaction and everything that he desires is at his own command. I really hope that he did uh, end his days amongst the crows and that he was living a very satisfied life. So that's my probably too rambly video about York, one of America's forgotten explorers. In my opinion, he definitely deserves his rightful place in history. If you've enjoyed watching my video, then uh, consider subscribing. See ya!